Hi, Lanita. Hi, Sanjay. It's an absolute <laughs> pleasure. Absolute pleasure to get the opportunity to have this conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, so Thank you for joining us. Uh, so actually, pretty much, you know, I, I mean, I guess let me get the fanboy moment out of the way for a second. <laughs> I'm a huge, huge fan of the work that you do. I think uh, movies, uh, the blogs, and I think you know, more importantly, what I love is just the candor with which, uh, you know, you speak about what you believe in. I think that's just, I, I find that hugely inspirational. So I just want to mm-hmm. say thank you for, you know, for doing that. Uh, so I, I guess at the start, uh, I mean, you know, since you know you made so many bold choices in your life right you know what's your kind of favorite break the bias i say favorite as in, you know what's your what's the closest one to your heart uh, you know, regarding break the bias um you know i mean i grew up in a fairly sort of open progressive atmosphere my father is a painter mother a writer and there was always freedom to question there was freedom to contradict um there was freedom to you know think independently and uh, do what you really believe in so i this whole thing of having this courage to break a barrier it never seemed a big enough barrier like i didn't have to really rebel against anything so in in some ways i realized that is a bigger privilege we always think of privilege as a more material and a more economic privilege and not to undermine that but i think the privilege to be able to just think and do independently and have the freedom for it was really great um in terms of bias i think there's all around us they are so omnipresent that whether it's the color of your skin whether it's you know you're being a girl whether it's in your luckily in my own family there wasn't any of it i was never made to like in my extended family yes some uncle or aunt or somebody would you know always pity me for the color of my skin or would say you know you're not going to get married or <laughs> you know all kind don't go out in the sun you must put this and stuff like that but in my immediate family i didn't have those pressures uh, but of course as an actor when i came into this field and i stumbled upon it with fire there was a lot of that pressure of uh, looking a certain way you know there is the, the women have almost been given a prototype of how your hair should be what your weight should be how your cheekbones should be uh, you know the color of the skin of course so um, every time they used to describe me it would always be dark and dusky you know mm. so there was always that pressure of first defining the color of your skin and it's strange in a country that's probably 80% you know right. this color or shades of brown for us to be so so deeply prejudiced about it and and also normalizing it you know it's not really seen as a an issue it's only in the last few years and i started supporting this campaign called dark is beautiful even though i had issues with the name itself because i felt like it still burdens you with this whole thing of beauty which anyway is a bit of a you know pressure on women and and it was but it was more a reaction to this whole fair and lovely kind of a uh, aspect and you know sort of responding to that so i think there is no dearth of ways in which one is discriminated constantly and those little battles that you have to keep fighting and i think the more educated and the more suave and the more sophisticated we become our prejudices get more covert and they are not out in the open but you know they are still you can you can feel them and you can't even articulate them and when you can't call it out more distinctly it's tougher because then you have to find the polite and right vocabulary to um, address it or you just learn to ignore it so um so i think over the years i've become more and more attuned to those kind of biases and prejudices and that's why i i still do ignore some of them just because it's just fatiguing and especially like you're working you know i just came back from a shoot and uh, when you have so much in your hand you feel like you know do you really want to deal with this right now yeah. or there are times when you have something really enormous in your hand and you feel okay i have to deal with this because it's really important to call this out and make this person realize that their unconscious bias is like glaring <laughs> you know so i think you you're so right right i mean sometimes uh, people people feel they're well intentioned and actually in a way they perpetuate yeah. but i i remember when we were having this conversation you know within the company as we were raising the awareness around unconscious bias to me the seminal moment was you know having a conversation with our leadership team 
and one of the men saying you know i'm extremely inclusive and you know i allow my wife to work yeah. right and you don't so, realize that so the word exactly. allow in his mind he was like i'm the epitome right i'm the bench yeah exactly but the choice of language tells you actually no <laughs> that's why words also matter you know sometimes we think we're just trying to be politically correct but uh, sometimes it can be a false thing because you can be politically correct and in your own actions cannot reflect any of that but words matter because they uh, they are a reflection of a mindset so the minute we say that you know you're you're allowed or not allowed you're actually saying that you have the power and that you are very magnanimously giving this power not realizing that you know you're you're not the giver anyway so yeah so that those kind of Uh, prejudices and biases are so around us and the unconscious ones like you said are well intentioned but if sometimes if we don't create that awareness we actually not helping the cause because that person doesn't even realize it you know right. that they they are being prejudiced about something so That's it's very, right what they say right most most good things uh, fall on the sword of good intention right so absolutely i am a firm believer of that and uh, yeah but which is not to say that those blatant ones of course need to be called out even more but uh, yeah definitely we need so to another w- one question for you right i mean again you know as as i look at the workplace i look at uh, you know uh, teams i look at myself all of us right this as much biases that we have internally about ourselves which also comes in the way right which is our own bias of like you know i remember in in many of the roles i played you know in my kind of career uh is that sometimes you feel i don't think i'll succeed in this role right you have this moment of doubt you have this moment of you know should i shouldn't i and then you go on to get past that moment of doubt and you you know you do well because you try but sometimes you don't do well as well but sometimes i feel so have you have you dealt with you know where you all, have a sense of all the time who, are, who you can be and okay. how do you bridge all that? the time i don't know about who you can be but that you're not good enough that i could have done better or that i should have behaved like this or i should have you know i i didn't push myself enough um i gave this talk but i don't think i made the oh, i forgot that really important oh. point that you know and you kick yourself for it or or anything in a film because it's locked forever and you feel like oh why didn't i do that and i ruined that scene and but you know sometimes we also beat ourselves more because we didn't have that information that we have now and we sort of think that oh i should have thought of that but maybe that time we were grappling with something totally different um i think women in fact come come with more sense of uh, i mean a lack of sense of self and a lack of self esteem much more because they've never been encouraged enough you are constantly having to draw your own energy your own strength despite all odds so um, men i sometimes feel are very confident sometimes more than they need to be um you know like even if of your achievements and i'm of course making it sound black and white which it isn't but a lot of the times i see the ease with which men are able to talk about their achievements and in a very black and like in a very sort of factual manner i did this and i did that and women are always giving disclaimers and you know sort of low balling and our kind of uh, sort of bringing in caveats that i did this but then you know i mean that's anybody would have done it and it's no big deal and we are all the time we should i think i feel we use lot more of those words so um you know and 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 there's nothing wrong i think in, to be vulnerable is a strength because you know not to be constantly having to be confident the world out there is telling us if you're confident then you know your thing but it's Correct. not necessary that you know sometimes you may know a lot more but you may not have the confidence to share it so it's that right balance where you don't have to posture and i think that's why authenticity is important honesty is important these are values that we don't um, give as much importance as let's say confidence and success especially in leadership roles no i think you you're so right because there's also i think you know it's reinforced in us that people with poise right uh, you know we have these words that describe what successful feels like and so right. you know, should not be in doubt you shouldn't you shouldn't be vulnerable because you know people who are successful are very stoic they're very assured 
They're never in doubt. They act with clarity. They're decisive. And so when people don't feel that way, and I've seen this a lot of times, when people don't feel that way, they feel, oh my God, I'm the wrong one because exactly. I'm feeling all the emotions. They just look like, you know, I can't be successful because I feel nervous, right? I have, I have Absolutely. anxiety. You know, I have but stress. that's what makes you human. And when you are vulnerable and you share openly and frankly, in fact, that's what connects people. I remember when I did my first film, Firak, a very senior filmmaker, I won't name, but he told me, he said, you know, you're, you're going to be asked 100 questions every single day. Finally, a director's job is to just make choices constantly. Even if you don't know the answers, always you have to show that you do because everyone's looking up to you, you know, as a director. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. If I don't know something, I'm going to say I don't know it. Just because I'm the director doesn't mean I have to know everything. I'll find the answer. I will ask more questions and make the more discerning choice. But I don't have to know everything. So this, I, I feel also in the corporate world, if I may say so, puts that pressure. Because it's also deeply hierarchical, like the film industry, you know, it's very hierarchical. And the minute you are, you have to be on the top end of the hierarchy or you are inching towards it, you have to show that you are a leader. You have to show that you know everything. And in that, you lose actually that collaborative sense, yeah. that, you know, that vulnerability. And to not be threatened by it actually requires a deeper sense of confidence. Correct. If you're truly confident, you don't have to show it. At, you know, you, you're confident, you're, you know what you're talking about. I don't need to posture and I don't need to show to others. And I think that connects people and vulnerability definitely connects. The minute you say, oh, I don't know, how, how, do, how does this work? Or oh, do you know, okay, great, you appreciate others. That gives them the confidence and you, be, you build a team um, you know, by doing all of that. So, and that's why a lot of women actually made for good leaders because they are collaborative and they are vulnerable and they seek help maybe more easily, you know. And, and sometimes, of course, women also become men to say that, you know, they, they feel that by doing all of this, maybe I'll be taken more seriously. And, and there is a tussle there, an internal tussle that I, I feel that sometimes that I've been trampled all over because I'm not being sort of more assertive or I'm not sort of, but then I feel that do I want to lose my basic self? Do I want to lose the person I am for the little time that I'm the director in a film or, you know, to, for the posturing that I have to do so that people take me more seriously because the right people will take you seriously for your work, for your vision, for your thoughts. So um, we don't need to feel you know, to scare. Oh, so, so another just, you know, I think one of the things you said about vulnerability, right? And if I kind of just move to an adjacent kind of uh, aspect of that, we've seen this a lot with the last two years of the pandemic, right? People working alone, remotely, uh, and, you know, it's almost like loneliness is the is the next pandemic. Yeah. Right? Because people so are, a lot of are mental health themselves. issues. Exactly. So, you know, what, what are some of the things you're seeing? And because you represent a, a cross section, right? Of people who uh, are either underrepresented or, you know, may not have the same voice uh, or the seat at the table. I mean, what, what are you seeing from the spectrum of, you know, people that you're working with in terms of mental health challenges? Yeah. And, you know? Definitely it has increased. Um, and it is across class, um, across gender. And a lot of young people are, in fact, having serious mental health issues. Because, you know, in this online world, they have projected a self of uh, an image of themselves, which is probably not their, it's not their true self. And they are constantly grappling with all those filters and likes and, you know, and competing within that narrow world. And uh, by not putting that same time and energy and passion into things that could actually further their, their own interest and, you know, their, their own identity. So we're seeing a lot of that. Uh, a lot of women, because as we know, during COVID, a uh, lot of women, in fact, um, had serious issues of overburdening of work, of domestic violence. I, in fact, I made a short seven minute film called Listen to Her, which is on YouTube, which sort of talks about some of these issues and that, you know, that it's not just the underprivileged women who suffered it, but even the privileged women were suddenly sort of were forced to be at home with their in-laws, with their spouses, with children, with other things that they were doing with no help. So there's a lot of mental health issues that have cropped up. Um, also, when you base your own sense of self 
on other people's views, whether it's criticism or praise. And during this COVID time, we were, we were meeting less people. So that means you had to really draw out your own strength or your own uh, sense of self. And, and you, know, you didn't have these other people to constantly pat you on your back. So then what, what happens? And, and there were serious, therefore, issues of loneliness. Families who weren't interacting so much with each other suddenly were pushed to being together. Couples were forced to be together. But a pressure situation, right, that you build up. In Absolutely. fact, you know, one thing you said, we, we're hearing this, we heard this from a lot of people, especially in the first year of the pandemic, which was, you know, when I'm, in, when I'm at work, I know who I am, right? Which is right. That's a, a part of the organization. But when I'm, when I'm at home and I'm on a work call, I'm right. also a wife, I'm also a mother, I'm also a daughter-in-law. And people don't see me, you know, for the role that I'm currently doing when I'm on a work call, they'll be like, you know, the kid is kid needs to be fed. So how can you be doing a work call at this time, right? And That's so people, because woman has to be the primary caregiver. Yeah. And this situation is not going to change till men step up and do half the work or, you know, even if it's not about exact 50-50, but step up from wherever they are and, you know, realize that a woman juggles so many things. I hope men have also realized during the pandemic because now they are actually seeing for once all the stuff that women are having to do on a daily basis. And you can't even complain because if you complain, then that becomes an issue. Everyone does that. I mean, you're not unique. You know, I, I remember when I was pregnant and I delivered and I was like, wow, this is tough. Why don't women talk enough about how difficult pregnancy is or how difficult it is to deliver or even C-section? You're like, oh, you had a C-section. Okay, great. Congratulations. What a lovely child or something. You know, you just, you just think it's one of the many things. And so I think a lot of it as women also, we have hidden, we have underplayed. We have not given ourselves the credit of the stuff that we do because we are not supposed to be pompous and we are not supposed to make a big deal about things. Uh, so, yeah, we also have much to learn. <laughs> so, in fact, you know, uh, on the thing of mental health, you know, one of the things, the journeys we've been making is really, we've always been about putting people first. So, as we looked at people grappling with mental health issues and, you know, mental well-being, we, uh, one of the programs that at least I'm extremely proud of is uh, we rolled out what we call the mental, mental well-being ambassador. So, mm -hmm. we look at uh, groups of people who are volunteering in and saying, you know, and we invest in them for them to get trained to be the first level of support for our colleagues. So, you know, and we keep having these batches of people. So it's really, it's within the ecosystem, but it does two things. One is you have those people available, but second, just by them going through the training, they themselves become more also empathetic and more, you know, it elevates Others. the consciousness. Right. Finally, mental health issues happen because you're unable to share. And some of it escalates because you haven't nipped it in the bud. You haven't shared it. You haven't seen those early signs. You haven't articulated it to anybody. Maybe because it's, uh, you know, fear of judgment or fear of shame or whatever that's attached to that issue. Like a lot of the LGBTQ community people have also said, like a lot of them don't come out because you feel that your parents aren't going to accept you or there's going to be, you know, issues at workplace. You're going to be made fun of. Or, you know, so, so just that freedom to be able to express yourself if it doesn't happen at home, because a lot of us spend a lot of time at workplace, especially in organizations and companies like yours. So I think to create that safe space within the organization, within the company is a, is a wonderful idea. No, in fact, that's where I was going next was, you know, yeah, we've been intentionally looking at saying, how do we bring in different kinds of talent into the workforce, right? At the end of the day, because, you know, our purpose is about enabling, you know, enabling people and their potential, helping people in, you know, what we call the brave pursuit of next. So as we kind of bring in more underrepresented segments, right, into the mainstream, into the kind of ecosystem of, of, of capabilities, uh, I'd love to get your perspective on, you know, what are you, what do you think corporates can do? better or more of to build more equitable workplaces because that's ultimately that's the thing that matters right otherwise it becomes a bit of a lip service of a yeah. poster that says we shall hire and we shall be diverse but then it stops with that act and after that the experience those that everybody has as a, as a team doesn't feel equitable right and then it, it just Absolutely. dies on the line and i see that these have all become buzzwords right inclusive um, inclusion and diversity and gender balance and all of that and even lgbtq a lot of these issues have become important i'm glad at least that they've started the conversation but like you said it has to percolate i think the leadership really matters like who are these people who are leading what are their personal views 
because we are the same people in a in at the core we are the same people at home and in our workplace if we truly believe in that if we lived our part then we are not just doing lip service if you know you as sanjay menon are actually that person at home if you are troubled by your own contradictions if you share that with your team and say you know we did this session yesterday and i caught myself saying this to my wife or i did that to my sister or i you know to my child or whatever or to my colleague when you become vulnerable then they realize wow i mean if he can be vulnerable we sure can or you know or to create those stories like story times you know why don't we have those times where we share openly or getting ideas from these people because all of these people have ideas what are we doing wrong because uh, even as companies this desire for praise we did this we did that we're all the time bringing those but what can we do or what we haven't done or learning from other experiences and experiments those are the things and not seeing it as criticism but seeing acknowledging that okay this is an open wound we are going to address it we are not just going to put a bandaid on top of it saying oh wow we still have 12% which is more than x company which just has 6% you know so of women or if it's lgbtq or you know did i have a bias when i was hiring this person because this person was dark wasn't as good looking as the other person if both have the same talent do they really have the same talent or is that how i'm processing am i lying to myself sometimes you know so those kind of i think conversations even within the organization and giving people the freedom maybe creating a box and anonymity anonymous kind of a thing where you can just write things that you've been uncomfortable with without naming anybody i mean i'm just saying on top of my head but you know creating actual ways in which this conversation doesn't become uh, only for a talk or when we are doing a celebrating a week of inclusion and diversity but like yeah. an everyday thing like something that's just part of your like like you have to meet your certain targets it almost becomes part of your and and about authentic leadership you know right. that I, think, i think that's the if i'm not doing something that i'm not doing right then please let me know that you know i want to give that freedom it is going to upset me i'm not going to like hearing it so in the moment i might even snap but trust me i want to know so you know giving that freedom in that space it's not always easy especially because it's so deeply hierarchical but i think it's lot of the role lot of the job is on the leaders if they change the attitudes and they change the game of the rules of the game then it does change it does impact well, i i think i i I agree with you. I think you know, as you said, creating that safe space, it's uh, it is it is essentially important, right? And 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 it's a journey we have. So you know, we're at a stage now where we are, we are welcoming people with all backgrounds, right? Saying you know, we need we need more such people because to your point, you know, we exist in a space where we are trying to solve complex problems for our clients, and complex problems need diverse perspectives. So even if you keep everything at the side. it is you know if you if you if everybody's thinking the same way you're most likely coming up with the same solution you know yeah so important diversity and inclusion right. what does each person think like you know often times we are saying but if we actually hear we will find the unconscious bias coming up and it may come out in one person but it allows us to address that so another i mean final question or final thought on you know uh, i think you touched on some part of it but specifically you know from again corporates or leaders right as you said starting with that i mean what are the one or two things you would you know you'd say i would really love it if i start to see some of these things more consistently just people doing rather than just saying i mean you know what are the one or two things you would think are really the you know the big i mean way? i think some are very visible like for instance whether it's caste or class or or you know gender or lgbtq to actually create a data and monitor it physically like okay are we really making that shift because when we talk in abstract our intention is there but if it if the shift can we monitor that shift and say okay if the shift isn't fast enough then what are those five things that we do need to like even when i am directing a film there are just more choices in men i have to really seek women it's really sometimes tougher and say come on it's just so much easier to get him man especially when there's a time crunch and you don't want to yeah so you have to go that extra mile you know to to be able to do that so are we seeking out enough diversity 
because if we just go with the common or just the way things are we are not going to find them we will have to make that extra effort and and maybe you know just have more sessions internally and sometimes in smaller groups people talk more openly because otherwise the same three yeah. four people talk and you don't really hear other voices and and allow i think also in the corporate sector often we talk about workplace issues when we start talking about our home issues like let's say if i'm biased about you but the minute i understand your situation maybe i will know and i'll understand oh you you often snap but i understand because your home situation is such that's why probably you snap you probably don't mean that so next time when you snap i'm not going to snap back and it's not going to escalate and therefore i'll be more considerate i'll say okay listen relax it's fine i'll do it you know and then you will probably say wow you didn't even snap at me because you every time snap back so i'm just saying that you know sometimes is, talking think, about our it's, own it's self so true, so true. <laughs> we, we we just in fact as part of you know celebrating uh, you know the women's history month and the international women's day we've been having people share their stories yeah and in all those sessions my one big takeaway was that as people got to know more about each other's back story Right? Exactly. It, it just completely like changes how you contextualize what the person says, right? And yeah. your, your point, it's suddenly so much richer, right? It's like you're suddenly seeing so much, so many more layers of the picture, right? And you understand that each one is grappling. Each one has a probably a bigger problem than your own self. And you know, if you do not like this person, a lot of the workspace problem happens because of egos, because of posturing, because of hierarchies. because you know everyone wants to succeed and who's nudging whom and elbowing and all of that but the minute you get to know that and minute you become more collaborative you there's a greater sense of empathy and i think empathy is such an important thing in any situation whether work or life or whatever we are never taught that in our education we are not taught that in our familial environment that you know empathy is really important and i feel when you create that sense of empathy then you just work better because you understand you are you are ready to you know stand in for someone else because you understand what they are grappling with and then you are not saying oh every time i'm sort of taking your place and you know you don't even care about what's going on in my life forget it i'm not going to tell you you know so all those things don't happen and and same goes for these causes the more we talk the more awareness we create the more stories we tell um i think that's how because it's, there's no easy solutions unfortunately yeah and there's no fast forward to this right i mean you, you know you oh. mentioned the thing about the metrics earlier the minute someone has a target what happens is there's this suddenly this urgency about hitting the number and so yeah, the, yeah, what do you do <laughs> so you know and some of these are the long game i mean it takes time right because you're you're changing mindsets you know it it takes it's not one conversation it's repeated conversations that are yeah and only when cumulatively it happens that we see it visibly till then the change is so imperceptible you can't even make out but you know if everybody is sharing that change or if everybody is saying that you know i'm the same person but and that's how i know that i'm i've changed right because in my core i feel i'm the same person that i was 30 years ago but how i know that i've changed is because my responses to similar things have changed and i feel like okay i'm sort of less angry about this or i'm less judgmental about this and you know this is a bias i still have to work on so things like that you know like i am i was very biased about corporate world and i really thought there were these big sharks and you know my interactions and then i understand oh they are so cut and dry and you know the all they can think of is everything is about numbers and it's quantifiable etc and then you realize but that's the world that's the pressure they are dealing with and many of them kind of open up when you talk about other qualitative or other sort of more ambiguous things because there is so much ambiguity in life but whereas everything has to be more black and white maybe in a structured space so you know how, how can one be comfortable with those ambiguities so i think our judgment decreases when we humanize the other and that's why that diversity and that inclusion is important because whatever perception whatever preconceived notion we may have had the minute we humanize and put a face and a life to that role or that person we say oh well i mean he or she is not so different they feel the same way you know no so otherwise the fear of the unknown is always much more i mean even with the lgbtq issue i find people have all kinds of perceptions when i did fire they were like oh was it tough to be a lesbian in the film 
I'm like, actually, that character was so relatable. She was impulsive, questioning, you know, all of the traits that I feel like I have. So it wasn't just because you, you're attracted to a woman, you know, doesn't change your all human qualities that you have. So I think it's, it's really about just bringing it in your world so that you can, you can see it for yourself. And, you know, only then can you lower your prejudices and all these biases that you grow up with unconsciously. Wow, you know, I'm taking away. I wish we had more time together. Thank you. So many things, but I, I love your view on the, you know, the empathy bias for action and authenticity, which I think is, you know, and I think I love the use the word humanize, right? Which is, you know, really, you know, take it down to the person. It makes so much sense. And and thank you so much for spending the time. I'm thank sure you. everybody's going to you know, log in and, you know, watch this. This is really going to, uh, you know, I think take away a lot from this conversation. So thank yeah. you. Thanks. All right. Take love. care. Bye. Bye. You too. Bye.